Uh, thank you, Ian. Yeah, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, when academic uh, freedom and inclusion are in tension. Uh, for the last several years, uh, tensions or perceived tensions between the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion on the one hand and academic freedom on the other have come to occupy a central place in controversies around higher education. Republican legislative campaigns against DEI administrators like those in DeSantis's Florida and elsewhere have made that tension a political football in partisan electoral politics. And faculty members across the political spectrum have been debating the appropriate role of mechanisms like mandatory diversity statements in hiring and promotion and the extent to which classroom curricula should, should be modified in response to student sensitivities. Although my guests today have different ideas about how the values of DEI and the values of academic freedom ought to relate, they both agree on one thing. Those values are sometimes in tension. The question is how to resolve that tension and how to manage the trade-offs involved. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce Amna Khalid and Stacey Hawkins. Uh, Amna Khalid is an associate professor in the Department of History at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. She specializes in modern South Asian history, the history of medicine and the global history of free speech and is a 2022 to 2023 fellow at the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. Stacy Hawkins is an award-winning teacher and scholar who has formerly served as the Vice Dean of Rutgers Law School in Camden, where she teaches and writes about issues at the intersection of constitutional law, employment law, and diversity. And I'm Len Gutkin, an editor at the Chronicle Review. Uh, thanks so much uh, to both of you for joining us. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start with you. In some ways, the theme for this conversation is taken from something that Fanice Miller, the president of Hamline University, said after her university failed to rehire an adjunct instructor who had shown a medieval devotional image of the Prophet Muhammad in an art history class. And some Muslim students complained, since for many Muslims, representations of the Prophet are forbidden. Uh, Fanice Miller wrote, we affirm that both academic freedom and our responsibility to foster an inclusive learning community, uh, we affirm both of those things. Importantly, these values neither contradict nor supersede each other. Amna, you wrote a lot about the Hamline case, which became quite notorious. Tell us uh, about why it mattered so much for you and uh, whether you still see it as symptomatic of something broader. How much time do you have, Len? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> um, thanks for having me on and nice to see you, Stacey. Um, the case at Hamline, I think, became um, a flashpoint because it really, for me, highlighted how DEI I Inc, as I've termed it with my colleague Jeff Snyder, and um, academic freedom are in tension. And this is not a resolvable tension all the time. So to my mind, academic freedom has to take precedence. It may not in any other institution, but institutions of higher education, that is their primary value. Now, having said that, I just want to be clear, it's not that I'm against diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm very much in favor of those things, but I think we need a broader conversation about what exactly that means and how that's going to be reconciled um, on an academic campus with other values that there are. Um, the reason that I think Hamlin really brought things out in a way that um, merited discussion. One, I don't think a higher ed institution had any business taking part or endorsing a theological point of view. So this is a debate among Muslims and they had no business taking a particular position. And the tragedy is that the diversity um, and inclusive excellence office, which is supposed to be promoting diversity, actually stunted it in the process by saying that the students' feelings were hurt and that they agreed that this was anti Islamic, um, I believe, is the word that was used. And in doing so, they basically flattened the diversity within the Muslim community. So as a Muslim, I was offended at that level. But most importantly, I, in, in, our con in the context of our conversation right now, as an academic, I was very disturbed by it because it is a truncating um, of academic freedom. And without academic freedom, I just feel we cannot do our jobs with integrity. So that's the bottom line. 
Uh, Stacey, I want to follow up with you because you've also written in our pages about the tensions that Amna describes. Uh, and you agree with her uh, on one very important point, which is uh, that you disagree with Fanny's Miller that there are no that there are no tensions between academic freedom and DEI concerns. But whereas Amna says, as she's just said, that academic freedom must trump DEI concerns, at least in the academy, when it comes down to it, you say, and I'm quoting uh, one of your essays for us, Stacey, you say that academic freedom may sometimes, and perhaps increasingly often, need to cede to the responsibility academic administrators have to effectuate the institutional commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I wonder if you could describe uh, your thinking there and perhaps uh, tell us about some cases in which uh, academic freedom ought to take a back seat uh, to DEI concerns. Sure, Lynn. Um, so again, thank you for having me. And hello also to Amna. Uh, I, I absolutely agree that DEI and academic freedom increasingly collide. Um, I, I don't think that um, the Hamlin issue is emblematic of um, how DEI ought to win out all of the time, um, or not all of the time, but some of the time. Um, I, I think even Hamlin admitted to missteps. I think that was their word, missteps in that situation. Um, and, and I think um, probably a lot of that was due to a rush to judgment, a rush to act. Um, and, and what I have said very clearly around this issue is that it really takes a lot of deliberative thought, right? It takes time because there is nuance, right? There is a delicate balancing that has to happen between two equally important but often competing values, and that is academic freedom on the one hand and uh, the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion on the other hand. And I really do think that there is no one-size-fits-all answer or solution. You really do have to be context-dependent. You have to weigh the facts and the circumstances. And I think that the one thing that is very clear to me is that we cannot simply say academic freedom has to always be the paramount concern. Um, I think that that is wrong because these are equally important values. And I don't think that just because diversity, equity, and inclusion is a newer value, um, that it's any less important than academic freedom. And in fact, it serves academic freedom. We, we really can't be kind of institutions of higher education, you know, fit for a 21st century production of knowledge and, you know, uh, uh, um, critical thinkers without understanding that diversity and, and fostering diversity of, of experience, of perspective, of viewpoints, of contribution contributions is necessary to that enterprise. Can I just respond quickly? And I, I really like the way you said that diversity um, encourages and um, supports academic freedom. And arguably, academic freedom actually is essential to have uh, diversity. Indeed, many um, areas that are now established of study on college campuses wouldn't have been there were it not for academic freedom. So black studies, thinking about women's studies, these are all areas that were fought for because academics actually had the freedom. The reigning um, ideology at the time or the reigning paradigm would not have allowed for them to happen. So insofar as how these can I would argue that academic freedom is actually essential to diversity, not the other way around. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that I, I you know, I love it when someone talks about the importance of context, and I couldn't agree more as a historian. I think you're, you're spot on. But the fact of the matter is that there are certain principles that we need to adhere to. And our core principle as higher ed institutions, to my mind, is academic freedom. And it, here it becomes, I think, relevant to define what academic freedom is. Perhaps there is some confusion uh, when people talk generally about academic freedom. I mean, I'm, I'm taking academic freedom to be the um, freedom to responsibly teach in the classroom, in the context of the classroom. Academic freedom you know, includes extramural speech, but right now I'm gonna to stick to the classroom case since Hamlin has been invoked, um, is to be able to teach with integrity. Now, it also says very clearly, and I, I have to say, you know, my hats off to the people who designed the academic freedom statement back in 1915, for, for whatever their um, identity characteristics may have been, there, were, there was plenty of forethought to say that, you know, professors have a responsibility towards how they present their material and they're dealing with young minds and they mustn't intimidate or discriminate. So to that, to, to that end, I think, you know, the way academic freedom is defined includes that responsibility. In the instances where professors choose to mouth off or take liberties that are, that, you know, 
are irresponsible, that, that's just malpractice as far as I'm concerned. That's not a matter of DEI versus academic freedom. So I think the issue that I have with the case in Hamlin is very explicit, expressly the kinds of DEI policies and approaches that are being taken on college campuses, the dominant ones, come in conflict with academic freedom in a way that actually undermine diversity and that are very detrimental for the learning experience of our students, particularly our minorities students. Uh, Stacey, did you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, area of disagreement is narrowing because if mm -hmm. Amna is going to define academic freedom, right, as necessarily incorporating academic responsibility, which I think often it does not, right? Often oh, academic- hang on, just- just to be clear, I'm not defining this. This is the AAUP definition. I know, but often people wield academic freedom well, people as- People may do whatever, but we're an having an absolute a principle sword, right? That protects them against any criticism, any kind of discipline. That's a misunderstanding of academic freedom. Oh, and, and I agree with you. I, oh. I wholeheartedly agree with you. So, so like I said, the disagreement is narrowing, right? The field of disagreement is narrowing because I think oftentimes in practice, the way academic freedom is wielded on behalf of faculty is that they have unfettered discretion in how they um, behave in the classroom. And that simply cannot be true, particularly in our increasingly diverse um, educational context. Um, and so I wouldn't I, disagree. If someone is misbehaving in a classroom in a way that is not responsible, of course, they should well, be well, responsible. Let's, let's, but let me pull this back to the Hamlin case, where I couldn't have imagined a professor behaving with more integrity and responsibility in the way that was introduced. And frankly, the entire irresponsibility in that case and the missteps are administrative missteps. They don't, they're fundamentally failed to understand what the teacher was trying to do, what the professor was trying to do. And there was gross administrative overreach, which we've seen DEI ha Inc. Let me just say, let me be very clear, DEI Inc. has uh, allowed administrators more overreach uh, on academic freedom in ways that is detrimental to the learning environment. And I think the Hamlin case showcases that very clearly. So, I, I mean, so, Len, you asked about an example. And, and I think that, like I said, Hamlin is not emblematic of what I'm talking about, where these sure. things come into conflict. And we really need to think about how academic freedom needs to seed, especially when we consider the academic responsibility part of academic freedom to DEI. And so I, I talked in the article about um, issues, and there have been several, where um, professors insist on using epithets or other derogatory language like the N-word in a classroom as a teaching tool, despite the fact that they have students, not just Black students, but non-Black students as well, who find that not only a offensive, but really just kind of disruptive, right? And not conducive to a, a, a useful learning environment. And yet those faculty defend on grounds of academic freedom, their absolute right to do that in the classroom. And I think that that can't be right. I think that it cannot be right that faculty have an absolute right to say that if I make a choice about how and what to teach, that choice is always going to be defensible under principles of academic freedom. That's what I think is wrong. I'm not going to stand here and defend people's use of racial epithets in, in class, right? Like that's, uh, but it's also a question of how they're being used and what context they're being used in. So I think this is a choice that professors make um, in different contexts. But if you're reading a primary source for a historian to actually engage with the violence of the words that are written by people, like if you're reading James Baldwin and you come across a word, um, that is a professional choice that a professor is making. But my point is that if a professor is being insulting or demeaning or disrespectful towards students, I think that is that is professional malpractice. But that's a separate issue from DEI versus academic freedom being intention. As far as I see, people may use academic freedom as a crutch to hide behind at that moment. But that to mind is my mind is not what academic freedom is. And I think we should be very, very um, strident in reclaiming academic freedom as the freedom to teach with responsibility and recognize that that responsibility is towards our students. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to defend um, anyone's right to, to disrespect their students. Um, I don't think that's academic freedom. Uh, Stacey, do you want to get a last word in before I move to the next question? Or And I think, and, and again, I think that there is wide agreement on that. I think that the one thing that I would um, question is who gets to decide? Because like I said, I think 
Lots of people misuse the defense of academic freedom to cover a wide range of sins, not all of which are defensible and not all of which should be defensible under principles of academic freedom as Amna has just defined them, but they do, they attempt to do so. And then the other thing is who gets to decide? And I, I think oftentimes, especially, and I talked about this in the article, as we look at the growing disparity between the composition, the de demographic composition of the student population and that of the faculty, for faculty to make a decision about whether or not something is appropriate or offensive or abusive in a classroom filled with people who they cannot identify with or relate with seems to me um, inappropriate. Right. And so we have to have a conversation about who gets to weigh in on the exercise of that responsibility right in the practice of academic freedom. I couldn't agree more. And I would say that the, the responsibility really lies with faculty. It's not just the faculty who is teaching, but faculty and curricular decisions, um, provided they are not in the realm of malpractice, lie with faculty and faculty committees, not with administrators. I have a, you know, that's where my stance is exceptionally strong. I don't think administrators are qual I mean, as we have seen in the case of Hamlin um, and in several other recent cases, academic, uh, a lot of administrators don't have a deep understanding of academic freedom because that's not their job. Um, and so I think it does allow for overreach in ways that have been detrimental. I'll pass well, it back to I, you, Len. I want to use that actually as a pivot to my next question, which is not about how things uh, should be, but about how things are probably going to be in both of your views in the, in the let's say, coming future. Uh, because this question of administrative relationship to academic freedom and also of DEI administrators' relationships to academic freedom has become very central uh, in the news cycle and on some campuses. Uh, so I'll mention one widely covered incident at Stanford Law School where a conservative judge had been invited by the Federalist Society. He was shouted down by protesting students, and he was also criticized by the attendant diversity dean um, when uh, a dean had been asked to quiet the hecklers and give the judge uh, room to talk. That incident resulted in an apology from the judge uh, to the judge from the law school's dean, as well as the then president of the school. Uh, the law school's dean, Jenny Martinez, after, afterwards wrote a widely circulated document on the importance of academic freedom, uh, in which she wrote, when a disruption occurs and the speaker asks for an administrator to help restore order, the administrator who responds should not insert themselves into debate with their own criticism of the speaker's views. And so she's referring to a very specific situation at Stanford, of course, but the document struck a lot of people as auguring a kind of larger scale rebalancing, at least at some schools, of the relationships between, uh, uh, let's say, top administrators like uh, deans and presidents and DEI administrators. Uh, there had It had come to seem as if there were some increasing tensions between those two groups. And so uh, really what I want to hear is what you each think might be happening along those lines in the future. Stacey, since you're, like Martinez, also at a law school, I'll start with you. Do you see signs of such rebalancing? And what would you like to see? How do you think these kinds of uh, distributions of power should, should play out? So the interesting thing is that I was just looking before mm -hmm. I joined this call at a proposed rule change to the standards that govern legal education uh, on behalf of our accreditor, the American Bar Association, having to do with this very issue and explicitly precipitated by this very incident. Um, and one of the things is to broaden the protections of academic freedom, um, not just to you know part-time faculty, which was part of the issue in, at Hamlin, but but also to staff. Um, and so you know I think one of the things that gets completely lost in this discussion is the kind of academic freedom on behalf of Dean Steinbach. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and again, I think that regardless of what you think about, you know, what she said, um, the reality is she wasn't the one who was shouting down the person. She was not the one who was shutting down the speech. In fact, her comments were very much that he should be allowed to speak. And she was looking forward to hearing him speak. She simply offered an expression of, you know, uh, um, context for how his remarks were being received and how his even his presence on campus had been disruptive. Um, and and I, I think we, again, my, um, my concern is how we tend to prioritize or value certain ideas and certain expression and not others. And, 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 and so we were very 
concerned about that invited speaker, Judge Duncan, being shouted down and, and having the ability to express what some people thought were noxious views. Um, and we really condemned this other academic, right, for her counter remarks, even though we say the best way to counter noxious speech is with more speech. And that's what she did. Again, we should certainly, right, manage expectations around the student population because we have policies in higher education. We understand that principles of academic freedom um, and even free speech mean you can't shout speakers down, right? You cannot disrupt um, a, a, a fora, but that's not what she did. That's what the students did, right? So if we're looking at her responsibility in this circumstance, all she did was counter speech with more speech. And I'm not sure why she suffered such condemnation on grounds of academic freedom for having done that. Uh, Amna, how did how, how does it look to you that? So I don't think, as far as I understand, I don't know exactly what her appointment was, but she was a staff member, not a faculty member, is my understanding, as the dean of DEI or VP or whatever the position was. And I don't believe they have academic freedom in the context of uh, they may have free speech rights, but their employees and their purpose uh, in an academic institution, I understand, is to facilitate education. Um, staff do not have. Uh, there may be a proposal to rethink that and that's great what we can have a conversation about that elsewhere but i don't think that this was a situation where she had any academic freedom the academic freedom was of the judge who was an invited speaker and i wasn't that concerned that the judge wasn't being heard you know i think he's been heard plenty i was concerned that we are modeling a situation where we think that this kind of behavior from students is acceptable to shut down speech and her job as a staff member in my view was at that point to remind students that they were violating the academic freedom of the of the judge and they need to sit, either sit down or leave uh, so to my mind i don't think that she had any academic freedom in that context and i think she is a an employee who have who abides by different rules academic freedom to me is a guild right of, yeah. pro of professors it does not apply to everyone on a college campus um clear there are lots of law law administrators who have faculty roles again when i was vice dean i was also sure. a member and that's why i said i'm not, not sure what her me. role was i understand that i don't know whether she was faculty i haven't anywhere read that she was a faculty member at all so i don't want to comment on her position the only position that i know about in that case is that she was staff so it sounds like you both agree that some kind of, uh, would it be orientation or uh, some sort of um, instruction for students uh, along the lines of, you know, modeling uh, ways of protesting that don't involve the heckler's veto, it, would that be a good idea at settings like Stanford Law? Is something like that uh, a good idea generally to just sort of diffuse these kinds of situations ahead of time or... I mean, to be honest, protesting is everyone's right. People can come and protest. The point is about disruption. I don't think it needs to be modeled. I think this, the students know this and sh they should be reminded of that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, what Martinez did in her letter was fantastic. It was the right thing to do in that she reinforced the importance of academic freedom in an educational institution. And Stacey, as a uh, as a law school administrator uh, at times in your own career, uh, what do you imagine uh, might happen? In the, like, uh, uh, again, not what you think should happen, but just how do you think things, uh, how do you, how would, if you had to make a prediction, if you had to put your money on it, how, how would you predict things will play out in the near future? Do you think there will be a kind of formal realignment along the Martinez line, or do you think that there will be other solutions uh, along the lines of expanded speech rights for non-faculty administrators or... So that's certainly the proposal currently in the legal academy, um, as I said, um, and it, it's it's unclear to me why an invited guest would have academic freedom rights, but an administrator of the university would not have academic freedom rights. Again, if we're talking about the academic enterprise and we're talking about, you know, a, a program that is being hosted as a an educational forum, then why don't all the people speaking there have academic freedom? Um, and certainly, um, Judge Duncan wasn't part of the guild of faculty, right? So if he has an no. academic right, then um, it must run to the forum, not to the person. Well, but putting that aside, I, I think that 
these things will remain complicated. Uh, I mean, we have not been immune to these controversies at our own institution. Um, and, and, and even during my time as vice dean, we had to manage issues of student protests with respect to speakers and students being um, unhappy about decisions that were made um, um, in, in terms of the um, academic enterprise and, and the program of legal education. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think that they're going away anytime soon. And I think we're gonna continue to have to wrestle with these issues, which is the reason why I think it's so important for people to understand that we can cannot simply say that academic freedom is going to always win out at all cost over these concerns about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have to be much more nuanced. We much we have to be much more attuned to the competing interests at stake here. And we have to really recognize that, you know, academic freedom serves all of our interests, not just the interests of faculty, right? It's on behalf of the academic enterprise writ large. Um, and, and students have as much right in having an environment that is conducive to their effective learning as faculty do to their effective of teaching. Uh, I think it looked like you wanted to jump in at one point. Was there? I was just going to clarify that, uh, you know, the reason that Judge Duncan had academic freedom and not uh, the administrator is because that's how academic freedom has been defined by the AAUP, which is what we, the body we turn to, which is when you have guest speakers, they have academic freedom, whereas staff don't. Now, if AAUP decides to revise that and we have a different understanding, Sure, we can revisit this question, but that's the reason. It's it's not the forum. It is it is the guest speaker who has the, the academic freedom in that context. But I just want to say that you know, to my mind, I, I'm all for um, more diversity in the academy, um, uh, in 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 all dimensions. Uh, I wouldn't be in the academy a hundred years back. So I'm, I deeply appreciate the fact that the academy is moving towards what needs to be done. But at the same time, I would hate to see the core essence and principle, which has actually uh, fostered more diversity and allowed for more things to be done to be sacrificed at the altar of DEI Inc. So that's my, um, I, I, I would think that would be a gross misstep. Thank you, Amna. And Stacey, any last uh, words to him? It's shocking to me, but we're somehow already out of time. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. I mean, I think that I can appreciate Amna's uh, continual reference to this DEI Inc. There are lots of aspects of DEI that I think do get commodified in ways that are not useful, and they can certainly be operationalized in ways that are even harmful, right? So I'm not going to always defend everything that gets done in the name of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But these are critically important and foundational values to higher education, particularly in the 21st century. And I think that we cannot paper over them. We simply have to take them very seriously and we have to mediate between these tensions um, of academic freedom and DEI. And while we might need to do DEI better, um, doing it better does not mean that we can stop, right, defending that interest. Thank you so much. This was uh, riveting, a lot of fun. Um, I wish we had another half hour at least. Uh, I didn't even, we had, I have more questions, but we'll have to table them for another time. But uh, it's a real pleasure to have two uh, Chronicle Review contributors uh, in the same virtual room. And I hope that we uh, see you both in our pages in the near future. Uh, and as you've both suggested, these issues are not going away anytime soon. So I expect we'll have plenty of opportunities for that. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Lynn. Great to see you, Amna. Good to see you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>